Hello again, and welcome to part five on the series I'm doing on how to obtain your ham radio license. Uh, those of you who have been following along already know that I got my ham license. Uh, I am now uh, Kilo Foxtrot 5 Golf Mike and Charlie uh, KF5 GMC. And it's still kind of hard to get that thing to roll out of my mouth. Some of the old timers, they, they've been doing it for years. They can just spit it right out. You know, I sometimes have to think about it because I haven't been using it on the radio. Uh, part of the uh, first video I did, I told you we would not only go through the process for getting uh, a license, which I've already done. I also told you we would uh, take a look at a radio, selecting a transceiver or a transmitter and receiver separate, whichever. You know, and you have to decide what kind of a ham operator are you going to be. Are you going to be one that hovers over the mic, you know, 24 hours a day trying to talk to everybody in the world? Uh, are you going to be one that does contesting, you know, where you go to a place where other people are and they all compete against one another to make uh, contacts with uh, other ham operators within the United States and, and in some cases outside the borders of the United States? I, I like to work on vintage tube radios, uh, get them operational, make them look good, and then give them to my family relatives. And when I have time, uh, I will get on my transceiver as a new ham radio operator, and I will say hello to people. But it, it won't be every day, maybe once of every two weeks. Uh, most of the time, I'll be listening. So that's the kind of ham operator I plan to be. So what that told me was, I don't need a ham rig that costs $8,000. And there are some out there that go up as high as 12000 I understand. I understand tubes uh, much better than I understand solid state. I can look in a tube uh, radio and I know what I'm looking at. I look into a solid state radio, a new, modern, highly technical type, and I look in there and I have no idea what that stuff is. Uh, I would like to be in a position to repair my radio if it went bad, uh, or at least have a good chance of repairing it if it goes bad. So I decided to go with a tube rig from the old days, a vintage uh, or antique transceiver. And after uh, looking on the internet and talking to people, and just a constant uh, uh, give and take on conversations on the antique radio forum, which I'm a member, I decided that what I wanted was a Heath kit. I wanted a Heath kit uh, and either a uh, HW101, which was called a Hot Water 101 in the old days, uh, or I wanted one of the SB models, uh, the SB 101, 102. So I really wasn't sure where I was going to get one. Meanwhile, I, got, I went ahead and, and I looked at all. I looked at them on the internet all the time, and I was just kind of, oh, you know, they, eBay had them, but some of them looked like crap, and and I didn't want to spend millions of dollars to fix it up. If that was the case, I might as well buy a solid state new one. You know, I wanted something decent, and. Uh, so after I got my ham license, I joined the Faulkner County Amateur Radio Club, and I, I paid my dues to the treasurer, my yearly dues, $10 here. And after I got done, we had a little conversation, you know, about this and that, and I mentioned to him that, you know, yeah, I was kind of hoping uh, that my first transceiver uh, as a new ham operator uh, would be uh, an HW, uh, uh, Heathkit HW101. And he looked at me and he says, well, I got one of those. I got a complete setup. I said, oh, really? How you like it? How's it work? He said, oh, I don't use it anymore. He said, I've got a, an ICOM or something like that, a Yezu, some, some new modern solid state type. I said, well, where's your HW101? He said, well, it's sitting in the closet, all boxed up, the whole, the whole setup. He said, I made it in 1978. Uh, he was in the Army uh, over in Germany, and he said, I put it all together. He said, I bought it as a kid. I said, really? I said, well, you ever think about selling this thing? <laughs> he said, well... Not really. He said, I, I don't know. He said, I don't know if I will or not. He said, I don't know if I want to sell it. I said, I understand. You know, you put that thing together yourself and it worked for a number of years. And it's sort of like, uh, you know, the piece of nostalgia there, you know. Uh, he says, yeah. He said, well, my wife's kind of urging me to sell it, but, you know, I don't know. I said, well, I'll tell you what you do. I said, next week I'll meet with you again. You think about it between now and then, and you tell me uh, if you'd like to sell it. Well... The next week I showed up, and he, he didn't show up until 45 minutes later, but when he did, he brought this baby right here. This is a HW, a Heathkit HW101 complete setup. The power supply, the speaker, and there's even a microphone he gave me in there that's not a Heathkit. And here's the radio. I couldn't believe it. It's in immaculate condition. There's a couple of tiny little problems, but 
uh, as far as uh, you know the cosmetics go. But this thing is a beauty. I couldn't believe it. Everybody that was sitting around the table when he brought the stuff in uh, into the uh, barbecue place where we meet every Friday, they went, "Oh my God!" You know, what are you going to do with that? I said, "Well, I'm, if he's going to sell it, I'm probably going to buy it." You know, <laughs> well, he did. He brought me everything to include the manuals. I got every manual for it. Uh, this uh, video will probably be so long it'll be in two parts because I want everybody to understand that uh, uh, this is really a nice rig. And uh, I want to get you a close up and let you look at it. Anyway, I said, Wayne, his name was Wayne, the fella that was wanting to sell it to me. I said, uh, How much do you want for this? He said, Oh, he said, I don't know. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I don't even know if it's still working. There may be some problems with it. He said, It was working the last time I messed with it. But he said, uh, Go ahead and take it home, set it up. And after you get it all functioning the way you want, just come back, you know, you tell me how much you think it's worth, and I'll accept that. Well, you know, I'm like, I'm just flabbergasted. You know, that the man's willing to trust me and my judgment. And uh, so I've been doing that. I've been keeping a record uh, of how much these things are selling for on the Internet. And uh, good ones all the way down to shabby ones, you know, what they call uh, project radios or tech specials. And... Uh, and I went ahead and fired it up. I brought it up very slowly on my Variac. I, I brought up the power supply. This this power supply is connected to this radio through this cable. Back in the old days, they had power supplies to keep the power stable so the radio wouldn't drift a lot and come and go and all that sort of thing. This is the cable that runs between the back of this power supply to the back of this radio. We'll take a look at it here in a few minutes. I'm not going to fire it up because it does have some things I need to fix on it yet. But anyway, when I fired it up, the uh, it received, but only if I messed around with the band switch, which is down here. This band switch down here uh, it had a contact problem, and so I cleaned it and, and cleaned everything else in, in the radio. I cleaned all the tube pins. I cleaned uh, as much as I could, every little switch, and then uh, it finally started working. But it wasn't working uh, it, on the receive side. It wasn't receiving the way I wanted it to receive. I knew there was something else wrong. So I spent the next two days, I tore it completely apart, checking every resistor in it, every single resistor. I used the, uh, the manual, and, I, and it, one, one good thing about checking every resistor in, in an old tube radio or a, or a, a vintage uh, transceiver like this, is you become familiar with what's in there. Uh, you use the manual, you find that you use the manual uh, during the entire process, and next thing you know, you begin to have a much more comfortable feel about your radio. You say, oh, I know what that is. That's the audio board, you know. And you know it's the audio board because the, uh, the manual told you, the assemb this is the assembly manual, which not only has uh, the circuit boards and, and all the components, but it also tells you how to set the radio up, align it, get it ready, and, and get on the air and all that stuff. That's at the rear. But there's, uh, there's uh, pictures of uh, each of the circuit boards in here and uh, you become very familiar with every little item on it. So I checked out every single resistor on every single board and when I got done I had a list of, uh, let me see here it is right here, I had a list, I broke it down by board uh, first was the uh, the IF circuit board, I happen to know where that's at now and the, uh, the band pass board, I know where that's at, the audio circuit board, I know where that's at uh, the RF driver circuit board and of course the modulator circuit board and I went down every single resistor and if it was within tolerance I drew a line through it if it was not within tolerance I made it yellow and you can see that the majority of bad resistors and this radio now I say bad I'm talking about way out of tolerance radios a uh, way out of tolerance uh, resistors uh, was on the audio circuit board uh, there, there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There was eleven bad resistors there, and I've since ordered all these resistors. Uh, I wanted to uh, <clears throat> replace them with carbon composition resistors. The original resistors were carbon film. I have carbon film, but I decided for this radio, any replacements that are going to be made are going to be done with carbon composition.